Okay. We have started the recording. This is our second lecture on BC 212, Christian Apologetics. So let's go back in the notes to where we paused. We share it. Okay. So this is where we paused. What <clears throat> what I wanted to bring our attention to is that in the ministry of the Apostle Paul, although he was a very educated man, a very trained man, a very scholarly man, he and he did reason with people. And and, and I've given you all these scriptures here. You know, we, we will read a few of these, but you can take time to read all of them. So Paul, in his ministry, he reasoned with people. But what I want to highlight is he did not only depend on his reason. Paul reasoned and demonstrated. That means, and we will see in some cases, where uh, reasoning itself was not sufficient. He depended on the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit in signs, wonders, and miracles in order to convince his audience, his listeners, that Jesus Christ is real. And so we must also do the same thing. right? So let's look, look at some examples. If we go to Acts, the 13th chapter, uh, uh, we won't read all these references, you know, I'd uh, encourage you to do it. Um, we'll read a few in class. Uh, Acts chapter 13. Uh, could somebody please read verses 6 to 12? Acts 13, 6 to 12, please. Somebody could read it for us. Acts chapter 13, verses 6 to 12. Now when they had gone through the island of, islands of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, and a Jew whose name was Bar Jesus, who was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elimas, the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, which stood then seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. The Saul, who also calls us called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, O full of all desire and all God, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Then the prophets are believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Mm. Thank you. So, Paul, uh, Paul and Barnabas, uh, they are on their very, very first missionary journey, you know, and they have just started their journey. So they have come. Uh, they have left their uh, home city of Antioch. Um, they've come to Caesarea, which is a seaport, and then. Uh, sorry, did they come to Caesarea? Um, anyway, they left Antioch, which is the home city, and they sailed across to an island called Paphos. Okay. Uh, they come to this island, and um, uh, they come to speak to Sergius Paulus. Sergius Paulus was an intelligent man. It says there in verse 7. That means he's the governor of this island. So... Uh, he's a very intelligent man, uh, so you can think, uh, you know, he is somebody who tries to reason, who tries to think. But this very intelligent man, Sergius Paulus, is also being influenced by a very spiritual man, meaning a sorcerer. Now this man, Bar Jesus, his name is, uh, or Elemis, the sorcerer, Elemis the sorcerer, he is a spiritist. You know, a sorcerer means somebody who's connecting to the spiritual world to do black magic and sorcery and all those wrong kinds of things. He is controlling 
or influencing Sergius Paulus. Sergius Paulus is an intelligent man. He's a governor in that island. And he's being influenced by somebody who's practicing witchcraft and sorcery and all that. So it kind of tells us that even intelligent people are can be influenced by spiritual things. So just because somebody is intelligent, you know, they're very uh, you know, intellectual, doesn't mean they are not spiritual. They could be very spiritual, you know, and in this case, it was true. Um, but he was being you know, influenced by a man who was practicing sorcery or black magic. So here come Paul and Barnabas into this situation. And Paul, as we can understand from this incident, he, uh, he is speaking the word of God to Sergius Paulus. He is teaching him about the Lord Jesus. He is, you know, his, you can imagine Paul must have been explaining to him as clearly as possible about Jesus Christ. But yet this man is being influenced by Elymas, who is a sorcerer. And at that moment, in that situation, Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, he rebukes or he, you know, speaks judgment on, on Elymas. He says, you'll be blind for a season. And Sergius Paulus becomes blind. Not Sergius Paulus, so Elymas, the sorcerer, becomes blind. And so this governor, he's amazed. So he's been hearing about Paul explaining the word of God. But now he sees the power of God. He sees that what Paul is carrying, Paul and Barnabas, what they are carrying is more powerful than Elymas, who was practicing black magic and sorcery. And so it says here in verse 12, you know, this proconsul, this governor believed. So in this case, beautiful example, in this case, Paul is speaking to a very intelligent man. So obviously he had to reason, he has to explain, he has to give an answer, he has to give an apologia, he has to tell him why Jesus Christ is real, so on. But what really convinces this intelligent man is not the reasoning, but it's the supernatural power of God. When he saw how Elymas the sorcerer was blinded by the power of God, he was amazed, he was astonished, and he just believed everything that Paul had explained to him. A beautiful example. So like this, you'll find many examples in the book of Acts. As you follow the ministry of the Apostle Paul, you will see that he reasoned with the people, but he also demonstrated the power of God. And so Paul reasoned and demonstrated. Paul reasoned and demonstrated. I think we go to Acts the 18th chapter. Acts chapter 18. And uh, we'll read verse 4, please. Acts, Acts 18, verse 4. And then we will also look at 1 Corinthians 2. Uh, one through five. So we will look at this combination. Acts, Acts 18, 4 and 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Somebody could read this, please. Acts 18, 4. Every Sabbath he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. Hmm. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 1 to 5, please. When I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom, as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you, except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I came to you in weakness and fear, and with much trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that mm. your faith might not rest on men's system, but on God's power. Mm. Mm. 
Thank you. So, in uh, First Corinthians chapter eighteen, the Apostle Paul is on his second missionary journey, and he comes into a place called Corinth. Corinth is a place where it is uh, at that time, in, in its time, it's we could call it the sin city of the world, meaning a very sinful city, notorious for immorality. And at the same time, it was a very, you know, it was a kind of a funny mix because it was a religious, it was a very religious place. They had the temple. Uh, uh, of uh, some some goddess there, who among where there were all these prostitutes and so on, and and yet it was a very sinful place. And when Paul comes into Corinth, uh, in fact, whenever he went into any city, if possible, he would go st uh, start off by ministering in the synagogue, where the Jewish people were already there. So that's what he did here. You know, uh, in First Corinthians eighteen, he comes to Corinth. And in verse 4, it says, you know, he reasoned in the synagogue. So look at that word, reasoned. He reasoned in the synagogue. That means before these Jewish people, he tried to explain to them who Jesus Christ was. He reasoned with them. And obviously, uh, for the Jews, he would quote from the Old Testament scriptures and explain to them from the Old Testament scriptures who Jesus Christ is. He reasoned with them. And yet, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we have a very interesting reflection by Paul on his own ministry at Corinth. So, Acts 18. It's Luke is reporting, Luke is writing, and Luke says, you know, when when the team went to Corinth, they reasoned in the synagogue. First Corinthians 2, Paul himself is writing. He's looking back about his ministry in Corinth, and he tells them, you know, he says, Brothers, when I came to you, you know, I didn't come to you with great speech and wisdom and so on. But I came to you in the demonstration of the Spirit's power. So, if we put these two together, if you put these two together, when Paul came to Corinth, he did reason. That means he did explain to the people about Jesus Christ. And yet, he did not depend on his explanations. But what he depended on was the power and demonstration of the Holy Spirit. So he combined the two. He did reason, but his dependence was on the healings of the miracles to touch the lives of the people. So uh, here again, another example where we do explain, we do reason, we do uh, um, present answers and explanations, but our dependence is on the power of the Holy Spirit, right? So uh, we must do both, right? reason and demonstrate. So that's why uh, I like to call this apologetics with power, right? So it's not just apologetics. It's not just I give you reasons. Because in some cases, reason itself will not convince people. But when we do apologetics with power, with supernatural, then people have no excuse. We've, we've explained to them, and we've also demonstrated to them who Jesus Christ is, and they have to make a decision. Right? So that demonstration of God's power, we have to be open. You know, sometimes. People, the very people who are asking questions could have a need in their lives which God can work a miracle. And when they see the miracle, they'll be very convinced about the things we are explaining to them. Okay? So keep this in mind. This is what we are learning, is how to do apologetics with power, 
uh, what we must learn to do is apologetics with power. We must reason and demonstrate the way the Apostle Paul did. And there are many other scriptures uh, throughout the ministry of the Apostle Paul where you can see this. All right. I'd encourage you to look at all of these scriptures. Uh, when you have time, just look through them in your Bible. Any questions before I move to the next uh, part of this chapter? Any questions so far? Everybody's okay? Okay. Let's move on. Feel free to ask questions. Okay. So now let's try to understand the spiritual side of what is happening. That means, suppose a person comes to you or to me and they are posing all kinds of questions to us. You know, how do you know there's a God? I don't believe there is a God. No, I, I am not convinced that God created everything. I don't believe the Bible is true, or whatever, whatever, you know, people can uh, pose all kinds of questions. And they come to you, they're asking you these, you know, all these questions. And of course, we are going to try to answer, you know, those questions. But I want us to understand the big picture, what is actually happening? So that we don't think that everything depends on our answer. There is a spiritual side to what is happening. That means there is demonic interference. The devil is doing something in, in the minds of people. So while we are providing answers, we are telling them why we believe there is a God, why we believe in creation, uh, why we believe in you know, a Bible is true, etc. When we are providing an answer, we must also keep in mind there is a spiritual side to everything, to all of this. And so in addition to our human response, which we will look at and how to do that properly, there is also a spiritual side. That means the devil has tried to blind the minds of people. And so the way we can break through to people is only by dependence on the Holy Spirit. Okay. We have to depend on the Holy Spirit. We will provide our human response, that is, as people, of course, we will do our part and we will answer the questions and we will do it the way the Bible teaches us to do it. But in and through it all, our dependence must be on the Holy Spirit. So that's what I want us to understand just keep it in mind uh, as we get ready to uh, deal with various questions on apologetics right so let's look at a few scriptures and maybe others i will just uh, you know quickly mention it uh, if we turn in our bibles to second corinthians chapter 4 and some of these scriptures of, of course are familiar to us uh, second corinthians chapter 4 could somebody please read verses Three to four, please. Second Corinthians four, three to four. But even if our gospel is wild, it is wild for those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe this the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Mm. So thank you. So the apostle Paul is telling us. Now remember who the apostle Paul is, right? He's a very scholarly man, very intelligent man, yet we have talked about his ministry. He is also very depend, very dependent on the Holy Spirit, right? So Paul is telling us, hey, listen, if our gospel is hidden from people, this is the real thing that's happening. The God of this world, the God of this age, he's blinded the minds of people who don't believe. And he's trying to prevent the light of the gospel from going into them. So Paul is giving us a secret. And he's telling us, see, this is the real spiritual 
dynamic that's happening. The devil is blinding the minds of people. And he's trying to prevent the light of the gospel from shining. So while we are giving our explanation, we are explaining the truth, the word of God, the gospel, there is also interference. The devil is trying to prevent the light of that gospel, the light that we are speaking. He's trying to prevent it from getting in to the minds of people. He's trying to interfere with that. So it's not just about our explanation. Of course, we have to explain well, we have to give an answer. But it's not just about that. There is a devil who's trying to interfere. And so we have to deal with that interference. We have to spiritually tear apart the blindness the devil is putting on the minds of people so that when we explain the message, when we explain the word of God, when we give an answer to the question, it should be able to go into their minds, into their understanding. Otherwise, it will stop right there. The devil has put a curtain and it won't get past the curtain. Right? And so this is where our prayer, our intercession, our exercise of authority comes in. You know, Paul tells us in uh, 2 Corinthians 10, uh, verses 4 through 6, he tells us, you know, the weapons of our warfare. They pull down these strongholds. They cast down these imaginations. They take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. You know, so with the weapons of our warfare, we deal with these mind things that the devil has built up uh, in, in, the, in, in the minds of people. You know, strongholds, arguments, reasonings, thoughts that are in their minds we deal with that we take it down using the weapons god has given to us so that the light of the gospel can penetrate yeah and uh, i'll just quickly explain in mentioning this in second corinthians 11 uh, paul refers to satan as the one who deceives who uh, who uh, uh, corrupts the minds of people. Second Corinthians 11 in verse 3 says, you know, just as a serpent deceived Eve, you know, that your mind may be, you know, he, he says he, he will corrupt the minds. So this is what the devil does. You know, he deceives and he corrupts the minds of people. And sometimes he does this even to believers, uh, try to preventing, prevent believers from receiving the full truth of the gospel. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 to 4, uh, we read about uh, seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. Maybe we can turn and read it, 1 Corinthians 4. Um, let's read verse 1. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 1, please. Somebody could read that. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 1. So then men ought to regard to us as servants of Christ and those... Mm. Entrance. Sorry, yeah. uh, uh, my mistake, my mistake. First Timothy chapter 4 verse 1, sorry. First Timothy chapter 4 verse 1, please. Sorry, my mistake. First Timothy chapter 4 verse 1. First Timothy chapter 4 verse 1. Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So the Holy Spirit is saying, and this was when Paul was writing, 1 Timothy 4.1, Holy Spirit is saying, in the latter times, you know, in our day and time, what will happen? People will go away from the faith. Why will they go away from the faith? Because they will be drawn away by deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. So think about this. Deceiving spirits, spirits that deceive. Spirits, evil spirits that deceive the minds, that, that basically promote untruth in the minds of people. Deceiving spirits and doctrines, doctrines means teachings of demons. So demons are inspiring certain kinds of teaching. So think about this. 
there are certain kinds of teaching or ideas and philosophies and arguments that are actually pr being promoted by demons, doctrines of demons. So these deceiving spirits, these doctrines of demons are affecting the minds of people, causing them to go away from the faith or even keeping them from the faith. So when we are presenting our answers, when we are giving our explanations of the truth, there is interference. There are these deceiving spirits. There are these teachings that are demonically, that are demonic. That are either they're drawing people away from the faith or that keeping them from the faith. And same thing we see in Revelation 12 and again in Revelation 20, Satan goes out to deceive the nations. And he deceives the nations. So in all of these scriptures, we uh, these scriptures are making us aware that there is this demonic side that is uh, interfering with the, the preaching of the gospel, trying to keep that from entering into the minds of people. And so in our preaching and teaching, we have to be mindful. That's where we exercise spiritual authority in addition to our preaching. Right? So what should we do as we uh, bring, you know, as we present our reasons, our explanations to the gospel, uh, we must recognize that uh, the devil can try to hinder us and not all all men not all people have faith paul says this in second thessalonians chapter 3 verse 1 and 2 you know he um, okay let's read it second thessalonians 3 1 and 2 we can read these verses please second thessalonians 3 1 and 2 Finally, brothers, pray for us that the message of the Lord may spread rapidly and be honored just as it was with you. Yeah, us too. Us yeah. too. And pray that we may be delivered from the wicked and evil men, for not everyone has faith. Mm -hmm. So, Paul recognizes, you know, there are people who don't believe and there are people who oppose all the preaching of the gospel uh, but what does he say he says pray 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 that the word of God may move powerfully you know so spiritual side we know the devil is interfering the devil is trying to blind the minds of people He's trying to deceive the people. He's trying to give false teaching, or wrong doctrine. You know, I mean, uh, all these wrong ideas, philosophies. He's trying to do all of that to deceive the minds. But from our side, we pray that the word of God will move powerfully. Right? We continue to proclaim the word, and we and and we pray. And then, what else do we do? If we look at First Timothy. Uh, sorry, let's go. I'm just skipping uh, verse 26. Let's go to Second Timothy, Second Timothy, chapter 2. Um, oh, wait, wait a minute. Let's let's let us read. Let us read First Timothy 6 20 and 21, please. First Timothy 6 20 and 21, and then we'll go to Second Timothy 2. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 20, 21. Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to your care. Turn away from godless chatter and the opposing ideas of what is falsely called knowledge, which some have professed and in so doing have wandered from the faith. Mm. So, what must we do? We must guard. We must guard what we have. That means you protect the truth that God has given to us. And avoid these 
unnecessary uh, you know chatter uh, talk and uh, avoid these uh, what what is falsely called knowledge in other words you guard and protect the truth and don't go and unnecessarily uh, this you know meddle with these wrong ideas and doctrines don't 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 get involved with that he's telling Timothy because that's only taking people away from the faith but we need to guard the truth that God has given to us right so we are praying that the word of God will increase we guard the truth and avoid these uh, contradictions of what people falsely call knowledge they think it's great they think it's knowledge it's like hey it's unnecessary and then in second timothy chapter 2 let's read that as well second timothy 2 verse 23 to 26 what does he tell us second timothy 2 23 to 26 somebody could read it don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels and the Lord's servant must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Those who oppose him, he must gently instruct in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. Mm. So, as we think about you know how to reach these people how to reach uh, people with the truth and you know give them uh, answers paul has told us we must guard the truth don't get into these idle chatter and now he's selling us don't get into these arguments with people don't argue don't fight. But if there are people who are in a position, that means they are asking questions, then he says in verse 25, in all humility, we are correcting or we are presenting the truth to these people. And we are looking to God so that God will grant them repentance, that God himself will work in their hearts to bring them to a place of repentance. So what's happening? You and I, in humility, are presenting the truth to those who are opposing us or questioning us, trying to genuinely asking questions. We are in humility teaching. In humility, we are presenting our answers. And we are depending on God to work in their hearts and bring them to a place of repentance so they can know the truth. And he tells us in verse 26, you know what's happened to them? They are in the snare of the devil, meaning the devils you know, blinded their minds. There are deceiving spirits, there are doctrines of demons that are corrupt to their minds. So they are in the snare, in the trap of the devil. And we while we are teaching the word and in humility we are correcting or presenting the truth we are depending on god to work in their hearts and bring them out of the snare of the devil so that is how we are going to work right we are going to pray that god's word will move powerfully we are going to guard the truth and not you know get mixed up with all these things that are opposed, uh, falsely called knowledge. And for those who argue and fight, we're not going to argue and fight. But if people are genuinely asking us questions, in humility, we are going to present answers and we're going to depend on God, that God will move their, upon their hearts, bring them to a place of repentance and get them out 
of the trap of the devil. So that's how we're going to do this. Right? And so, in this whole process, our dependence is on the Holy Spirit. Right? Because there is a spiritual battle involved. It is not just about me giving nice answers and you know, uh, explaining everything nicely and teaching everything nicely. It's not just about that. Because on the spiritual side, there is the devil, there are deceiving spirits, doctrines, demons, that's blinding the minds of people. And so from my side, from our side, as we bring answers to people, as we present answers, we have to depend on God to bring those people to a place of repentance and that God will move on their hearts so that those people will be able to come out of the snare of the devil. And this is where the Holy Spirit comes in. This is the Holy Spirit's work. So if you look into John chapter 16, uh, I guess we just, John, let me give you the exact verse. John 16, right? Um, let's read verse 8. John 16. Verse 8, please. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. Mm. Notice what the Holy Spirit will do for the world. Now, we know the Holy Spirit is uh, ministering to the believer. Uh, the Holy Spirit is doing a lot in the life of the believer. But notice what he will do for the world. That means people who are not saved. He says here in verse 8, Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world. Right? Who is going to convict the sinner? The Holy Spirit. He's going to convict them of sin, of righteousness and judgment. Right? He's going to do that. He's going to move in their hearts and tell them, you know, there is sin in your life. And you need to deal with it. He's going to convict them of righteousness. You know, see, you're not right in the eyes of God. He's going to convict them of judgment. You see, you're going to stand before, in judgment before God. Who's going to do that? The Holy Spirit. So we, as we give our apology, uh, we present our you know, explanations and our defense and our reason. While we are doing that, we are also depending on the Holy Spirit to convict their hearts. It's not my explanation that will convict the people. It's not my reasoning that will convince them. No, the Holy Spirit has to convict their hearts. Right? And also, we must not forget that when we live our lives before people, God will use the testimony of our life to speak to people. Uh, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. 1 Peter 2, 11 and 12. Can somebody read that, please? 1 Peter 2, 11 and 12. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, a best time from fleshly lust which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evil Jews, they may by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Mm. So Peter is telling believers, he says, I want you to you know, live righteous lives. Stay away from fleshly lusts and all of that. Uh, verse 12, uh, you, know, you, you have an honorable conduct before the Gentiles, the unsaved, and live right before them, even if they are speaking against you. You know, even if these people are speaking against you like evildoers, you live, you just live right. Why? Because he says, in the day of visitation, that means when God visits them, when God encounters them, what will happen? By your good works, they will glorify God. 
So if you try to understand what Peter is saying here in these two verses, he's telling believers, you live, live righteously before God, have an honorable conduct before the unbelievers. Even if they are right now, they may be speaking evil against you. You just live right. And on the day of visitation, when God visits them, they will remember the life you lived and they will glorify God. That means God will use the testimony of our life to touch them, touch their lives. Right? So we depend on the Holy Spirit and we choose to maintain an honorable conduct, a, a good life testimony before people. And one more point I just want to bring to our attention in, in this is uh, that you know, it is interesting how conversion happens or how a person turns to God. How does it happen? In Second Corinthians chapter 3, and I'll just point you know, one verse. I, I, I have mentioned the whole passage there. Um, in Second Corinthians chapter 3, if somebody could read verse 16, please. Second Corinthians 3 and verse 16. Second Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Okay, yeah, thank you. So, what Paul is saying, and, and, and uh, I've skipped the previous verses, but what he's saying is, when the heart turns to the Lord, then the veil is removed. So the veil he was referring to, if you read the preceding verses, he's talking about the hearts being blinded. He's saying when the heart turns, the veil is removed. So this is what happens uh, when a person comes to know the Lord, or comes to the truth. God works in the heart of this person and the heart turns to God. And at that moment, everything that was blinding this mind is removed. The veil is removed. Right? So both these things are happening, and God is doing it. So when we are presenting uh, the, the, the explanations, the apology, uh, we are depending on the Holy Spirit, God works in the heart to turn the heart to Him. And when the heart turns, the questions, the veil, the arguments, the blindness is removed out of their lives. So that's why we are saying, you know, the head follows the heart, meaning the heart goes first and then the head comes, you know. God works in the heart and turns the heart to the Lord and then the head comes. The heart believes and the head follows that belief. Okay, so why is this important? Why do we need to know this? Because don't put pressure on yourself to do everything. No. Our responsibility is to bring in the explanation. Our responsibility Okay, let me share with you what I know from the Word of God. I will answer your question to the best I can, but we are depending on the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will convict their hearts. The Holy Spirit could take even a simple sentence that you have said and convict them in their heart. The Holy Spirit could take one simple truth that you have shared and speak to their heart. Right? And He will use your life testimony before them on the day of visitation. And from inside out, the Holy Spirit will change the person, right? And He will remove the veil. He'll remove the blindness, the arguments, the strongholds, the reasonings, the thoughts that were opposing the gospel. The Holy Spirit will deal with that, okay? So understand, 
that while we are presenting the gospel, we must depend on, on God to touch the hearts of people. Okay, I'm going to pause here. There's just a little bit more to complete in this chapter, but uh, I don't want to rush through it now. Uh, these last three points, uh, uh, we'll, we'll pick it up next week. I'll just finish off this chapter. And uh, next week, we get into our very first topic on the on the existence of God and creation. You know, how can we say we know that God exists and that there is a creator? So that's the first topic we will pick up uh, next week. And I'll just quickly finish this little remaining part, and we will get into our first main topic. Any questions on today's, both the lectures today? Is everything clear? You're all with me? Um, is it getting too heavy? It's OK. It's still OK. OK. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. All right. Okay. So, yeah, um, thing everybody's following. Okay. So let's close in prayer today, and we will finish up the little little part that's left, and we'll get into uh, the first big question on existence of God and creation starting next week. Mm -hmm. Somebody could please pray with us and dismiss us today. Go ahead, Sid. Father, we come to the throne of grace. Lord, thank you for this day you have given us, O oh Lord. Lord, mm -hmm. as we have started this course, Lord, Lord, we bless our teacher, Lord, Pastor Ashish. Lord, we bless all the students who have listened to this course, Lord. Lord, as we are starting to learn about you, O oh Lord, guide us, protect us, and give us knowledge and wisdom so that we can understand and learn and keep in our heart and mind whatever is being taught by Pastor Ashish, Lord. Thank you for this day you have given us, Lord, and thank you for all the network connectivity and all the people who are joined from different countries, so Lord, across the globe. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, have a quick break and get ready for your next class. I'll see you again next week. God bless.